Has tongues, prophecy, and knowledge ceased? Let's talk about that today in the Word. Good morning, and welcome back to Today in the Word. Hi, I'm Glenn Schaefer, and we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 on the love chapter. We're going to be addressing verse 8 down through the rest of of this chapter. Thank you for following us, whether you are listening on our podcast or YouTube. Today, we're addressing the idea of tongues, prophecy, and divine knowledge. Has it ceased? Well, let's talk about that as we walk through these verses concerning the permanency of love. In this chapter, when it talks about there's three that remains, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. Well, what is Paul trying to say in this passage? Obviously, he's emphasizing the permanence of love. Verse 8, love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but, that, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. Now, this passage is the one that's often used by cessationists to say that tongues and the gifts of the Spirit are no longer for today. And they most generally apply this word perfect to be the New Testament canon. We addressed this in some of our earlier teachings, and all of us would embrace the Bible as perfect. Of course, it is the Word of God. And actually, you're reading into the verse here something that the Bible does not say. And what concerns me are so many of these who are cessationists are generally good at exegeting the Scriptures. But here, obviously, they come with a prejudgment, a presupposition, and say that's what we're going to make this verse say when in context is obviously not saying that at all. What he's saying is that love never fails. But whether there's prophecy and tongues and the use of word knowledge, of course it has to be divine knowledge like a word of knowledge, because certainly it's not knowledge. <laughs> we always are going to know. But it says when that which is perfect is come. The perfect that is mentioned here is obviously not the New Testament canon. Paul writing that would not have known that at all would not be referencing that. As perfect as the New Testament canon is, that which is perfect obviously is Jesus Christ in the resurrection. Now you can read any commentary. Matthew Henry says it means the future of the church, meaning the resurrection. Barnes commentary says the sense here is that in heaven a state of absolute perfection that which is in part, in quotes, or which is imperfect shall be lost in superior brightness. All imperfect imperfection will vanish. Now, Barnes' commentary is certainly not one who believes in the gifts continuing, and yet he says that which is perfect has nothing to do with the New Testament canon. It has to do with the perfect place and state in eternity in the resurrection. Gill's commentary says the same thing in the quotes. This means at the resurrection. Even John Calvin thought the word will see spoke of the eternal state when he says, but when will that perfection come? It begins indeed at death because then we put off many weaknesses along with the body. So that which is perfect, he's saying then tongues and prophecy and knowledge meaning, I believe, divine knowledge or word of knowledge. It just references those revelatory gifts and this one utterance gifts of tongue will continue until when? The resurrection. Now, this fits other times in Ephesians chapter 4 as well when we're being given apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the equipping of the saints until what? We all come into the unity of the faith and grow up into the head, which is Christ. And that's going to continue all through the church time until the resurrection. He must reign until he's put all enemies under his feet, talking about Jesus Christ. And then the end will come. And then he will turn over 
the kingdom to the Father so that all may be in all and complete. Right now, Christ, the head of his church, is not going to malign his church or take away from his church the very power of the Holy Spirit. Now, I understand there's a lot of balance that needs to be given into the modern charismatic movement, but that's beside the point here. Obviously, prophecy will not be needed in the resurrection. And, obviously, even faith, if you want to say that, even hope, because our faith is in the saving work of Christ. Our hope is in the eternal work of Christ. And that which remains is what? Love. So he's using this idea that love remains. Love will never cease. It does not end. It continues on when the gifts, of course, will not be needed then. And why? He uses this concept for we know in part, meaning even now, what we receive in prophecy and what we receive in tongues and divine knowledge is only a part. It's not intended to be the whole thing. That's why it's called a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom. And that's why prophecies have to be judged. And we'll get into that in chapter 14. If we're saying that prophecy is perfect to the Old Testament or New Testament scriptures and canon, then there would not need to be judged. Obviously, here in the scriptures, or we're going to see in chapter 14, if one prophesies, the one setting by is to judge that prophetic word. Now, and he's not judging to see whether it comes to pass. That's an Old Testament concept. It's to judge it by those who are there. Why? Because we see in part and we prophesy in part. But there will be a day when the resurrection that we're going to be fully known, and you're going to be able to understand this more clearly as we go through the next part of the Scripture, because he says in verse 11 and 12, When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. Now that verse is often used to say, see, therefore, tongues and prophecies childish. Now we have matured. Well, I hope we have matured, but we have not come fully into the maturity and the perfect stature of the knowledge of Christ. That comes throughout the whole church age, of course, until the resurrection. This is the time of Christ's kingdom in which he rules and reigns through the gospel in the church and through the church. But in comparison, Paul is saying, compared to what we're going to know, compared to what will be to see him face to face, it's like childishness. <laughs> He said, when I was a child, I spoke like a child, I understood like a child. He's saying, compared to what we see now in part, to what we're going to have in eternity, it's going to be like from a child to adulthood. Now, he says in this passage, we see in a mirror, the ancient Roman and Greek mirrors, they would have polished some metal so you could see. It would not be as clear as our mirrors are today. But he's saying it's, it's dimly. But then we're going to see face-to-face -face just as clearly as we were looking face-to-face -face with God. Now, the Scripture says in Exodus that Moses met with God face-to-face, -face, but that is really more of symbolic, meaning figuratively, rather than really face-to-face. -face. For no man can see God face-to-face. -face. His glory is so mighty. That's why Moses said, even I am fearfully and afraid uh, at the Mount Sinai because of God's glory. We could not handle all of God's glory, seeing him face to face. But then we will. <laughs> oh, why? Because now we see in part. We, there, there, there's a, it's dim. It's not clear. So even the gifts today, the prophetic gifts, are not what it will be in all of eternity. For we will know, he says, for now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I'm also known. I'm going to see as clearly then, as I could looking at my own self. He said, the mirror now is not clear, but then it will be clear. So obviously, in these passages, Paul's not saying that prophecy and tongues and knowledge has ceased now, but it will in all eternity. It's very clear. Why? Because he's making a comparison with love. What is the greatest of these? There's three that remain, faith, hope, and love. Let's read that in verse 13. And now abide faith, 
hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Why is it the greatest? Obviously because God is love. Love will never cease. Love will even be understood more clearly. But prophecies, you won't need them. Tongues to edify through interpretation or even in your own prayer life will not be needed. Divine knowledge, you will see face to face. Compared, it's like a child to an adult. And so he says, then, if that's the case, it's not about miracles, even though miracles are wonderful. It's not about all of those things. It's about love. There's faith, hope, and love, and the grace of these is love. That's why he says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and your labor of love and the patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God and Father. Yes, we live in faith and hope until the resurrection or till the end of our life. That's why he says in chapter 5, of 1 Thessalonians chapter 8, but let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Hope is in the eternal work of salvation. Our faith is in the eternal work of salvation. Love is, of course, goes beyond this life into all eternity. You say, well, we have faith in eternity and hope. Well, in that time, our salvation will be fully realized. Now, we know that we're fully in Christ now, but our bodies are not resurrected. So in that sense, we have not inherited the fullness of our salvation because we are born again in our spirit. Our souls, our mind, our will, and our emotion is in a process of being converted, if you want to say that. As Paul says, be you not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? So you might demonstrate, approve what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Our mind has to be renewed. So you could say our spirit is saved, our mind is being saved, and our body will be saved if you follow that in the resurrection. So there is a place in time in which our faith is present and our hope is present, but in eternity we will have received it fully. For the scripture says, for we through the spirit eagerly wait for the hope of of righteousness by faith. What is that? That's that eternal hope in Christ. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. Galatians chapter 5, verse 5 through 6. Now listen to this. In 1 Peter 1, it says, Who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Since you have been purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently in your spirit. Well, the Bible is clear that our faith is in Christ, our hope is in Him. It's laid up for us in heaven. So when we get in heaven, we'll continue, of course, in love. That's why it says the greatest of these is love. There's three that abide. And in this passage, Paul is making that clear that love never fails. We won't need prophecy. We won't need tongues in eternity. We won't need divine knowledge because we're going to see completely face to face. Wow. Thank you for joining me today in the Word.